very much. And I want to thank uh, Matt and the Executive Committee for inviting me to the uh, boot camp today. It's been a lot of fun so far to see the talks, and I'm looking forward to the talks uh, later today and tomorrow. I have one quick digression to make, just listening to Harriet talk, and a um, quick, really quick story. But back uh, at one of my first conferences, international or national conferences, during a poster session, I remember Harriet came up and was asking me some, what I thought at the time was very hard questions, right? But I have to thank you for that, because I, I learned a lesson there a long time ago, and uh, it just came back to me as you were talking. That lesson is always be prepared to answer questions from Harry DeWitt if you're going to do a poster <laughs> session. So it's, uh, I think, a, a good thing. But um, so uh, I'm going to talk to you today about our work on real-world cannabis products. Do we have a third? There we go. And uh, let's see, I'm going to go backwards. Is there a back? Let's see, there we go. Okay, no disclosure, and you can tweet if you want. And um, so what we're going to talk about is um, real-world products and uh, potential risks and benefits. So for the last 50 years or so, the focus of, of research has really been, until recently, about how cannabis is bad for you. So really new running all the ways that cannabis is bad for you. And it's also so it's sort of nearly focused in that sense, or was nearly focused in that sense, but also it's nearly focused in the sense that we were really um, using one type of cannabis, right? So if you were doing experimental work like you've seen today, that was cannabis coming from, at least in the U.S., cannabis coming from Mississippi, from the government farm, um, which was pretty narrow in terms of the range of what you could get. And if you were doing cross-sectional studies, survey studies, if you were doing MRI studies comparing cannabis users to non-users, of course they were using whatever they could buy illegally on the black market. And, and you know, so if you're interested, for example, in new products like edibles or concentrates or topicals or high potency flour or flour, you know, range of different cannabinoids, it was really hard to do that work. And the one exception, of course, being Brian Vandry, who came up with the uh, Duncan Hines uh, brownies, right? So that's about the only edible study I can think of. So, um, so really what we're talking about here is reframing the question, right? Because if you're, if you're uh, a patient, you know, if you're talking to your seven-year-old mother who's had chronic pain for 50 years, you, you know, you probably don't want to be quoting the statistic about, you know, the rate of cannabis use disorder in 22-year-old males, right? So this is another way it's kind of been uh, narrow, and I think it's really important here that when we talk about this research and we think about design new studies, we're basically thinking about, um, you know, how to talk to people about the risks and benefits, because your 70-year-old mother or that cancer patient, they want to know what are the risks, but they also want to know what are the benefits, because they want to weigh that out, right? They're trying to weigh these things out. And you know, given that most of the work on, on harm has been with, with young people, and you know, it, it makes sense that this is context specific, right? We need to be doing work in populations to understand the harm, potential harm, potential risks and benefits in specific populations. And that's really what we've been trying to do. But I'm gonna start uh, by giving you some earlier work in terms of the effect of uh, cannabis and alcohol on the brain. So this was, um, we had um, been doing a lot of MRI work, a lot of imaging work, um, for many years, and we had accumulated 1,336 individuals, mostly who were scanned in New Mexico. And, uh, and that sample of 882 adults and 454 adolescents. And so of the adults, there were 345 individuals who were also using cannabis, and 190 of them were using more than once a week. With the adolescents, we had 275 cannabis users, and 198 who were using more than once a week. So we wanted to take a look at this issue of are there, can we detect any morphological changes in the brain related to cannabis use? And one important thing when you're doing this work is, of course, also to look or think about how to control alcohol use because oftentimes they go together. So what we did was we did an analysis where we we're basically looking at the effect of alcohol while controlling for cannabis use and then flipped it around and looked at the effect of uh, cannabis while controlling for alcohol use. So I'll show you the, uh, this is published in Addiction um, a couple years ago. I'll show you what it looks like. So here's the, the adult sample. And you can see on the, on the left there the effects of alcohol in blue, and this is where gray matter, uh, basically the volume is, is lower uh, in, in relation to alcohol use. And so you see a pretty pervasive effect in terms of the detrimental effects of alcohol on uh, gray matter density. Now when we looked at the effects of cannabis while controlling for alcohol, basically we didn't see any effect in, in this large sample. So we did the same thing, but looking here at white matter integrity. So looking at white matter integrity, Again, not unexpected, when you look at the effects of alcohol while controlling for cannabis, 
what you see is pretty pervasive effects, detrimental effects in terms of, of alcohol and white matter integrity. When you look at the effects of cannabis with, uh, while controlling for alcohol, we didn't see any significant effects. So um, I, we also looked at the same thing in adolescents, and I didn't I include the slides because we were under kind of a de, um, time, you know, strict timeline here. But basically, in adolescents, we didn't see much of an effect for either alcohol or cannabis. So my grad student, Rachel Thayer, was thinking, okay, well, that's interesting. And if there really is this relationship between cannabis exposure and changes in brain morphology, why aren't people looking at the elderly, right? So let's find a sample of, of older adults who've been using their whole life, and let's see if we can detect morphological changes in those individuals. So she recruited for a dissertation 28 regular users over the age of, of 60, and the mean number of years of use for these individuals was 20. Um, and then also she recruited 28 controls with no history of cannabis use, and compared them on brain morphology and also uh, in, in NIH neurocognitive battery. So this is the, um, this actually is just coming out, uh, should be published uh, soon online, but what you can see here is basically the figure showing very little in terms of differences between uh, older users and controls. And I think the only thing that, that popped out in this analysis was a slight difference in the left putamen where the users actually have a, a, you know, more gray matter in the left putamen than the than the controls. So also looking at the NIH uh, cognitive task, no differences there between the users and controls. And when we broke it out and looked at, um, you know, we, and our 28 users, we actually uh, sort of divide those into heavy users and less heavy users. And the heavy users, so the, the 14 people above the median, they had an average of 40 years of, of use of cannabis. And they're not using lightly. If you look at the last 90 days, they used about 70 days out of the last 90 days, right? So definitely a heavy using a group who've been using for a long time. And again, no differences from controls. So not much evidence there, and I will you know, caution you, it's a, it's a small study, right? So um, that's always important when you're looking at, uh, at imaging data. Okay, so then um, usually I have a few more slides on this, but we published some of this work and you can always look at it later. But the bottom line is we haven't seen any consistent evidence that cannabis use causes long-term pervasive changes in brain morphology. And if you look at the literature, there's definitely a number of smaller studies that might suggest there is one. But if you look carefully, they typically find effects in different brain structures across studies. And I think there's, there's something there in terms of the, you know, the, the methods and the smaller sample sizes and maybe some confirmation bias there. Now, does it mean just because there's an absence of evidence here in terms of the effects of cannabis on brain morphology, that's not necessarily evidence of absence. Eventually, you know, we may find something, especially given that everything's changing in terms of the potency of products and the products that people are using. But um, you know, at this point, it, it doesn't seem like there's any consistent evidence of that. And again, the, the final point here is it doesn't mean that cannabis is harmless just because we're not finding consistent you know, pervasive effects on brain morphology. Okay, so, um, so you know, basically when we started this research three or four years ago, we saw this as a really important public health issue. And um, you know, we were very interested in trying to do research on products that people are actually using to try and inform patients and consumers. And the, the issue, as I alluded to earlier, is that you know, most of the prior research hasn't factored in things like potency and dose, cannabinoid profiles, terpene profiles, the type of product, you know, group administration, topicals, edibles. Uh, and so, uh, nor really factored in the possibility there might be differences in risks and benefits between medical users and recreational users. So we really felt like we needed a new approach and, and we knew it had to be creative because the, of course the, the problem in, uh, in the US is the major obstacles to doing anything uh, creative, which we still have today. So, so the bottom line is we uh, work carefully with our legal team at the University of Colorado and this took, it was um, you know, legal wrangling that went over a couple of years, actually it took a long time to get this done. But I'm you know, really uh, grateful for the fact that they were able to, to work with this. But basically, you know, we went through all the different legal issues. You can't have cannabis on campus. I can't personally touch cannabis. You know, we can't tell people exactly what to do with the cannabis. And um, we, we had these strange conversations where I would ask them, well, can we rent a house off campus? And they would be like, no, if you lease the house off campus, that becomes the workplace. And it's a federal workplace, and so you can't do anything there either, right? And so. So finally, we came to this idea of a, a mobile pharmacology lab, right? So we can't have people use cannabis on campus or in a place we lease, 
but they can use it in their own home and it can come down to the van and be assessed, right? And you know, it even got so, so strange at one point I was trying to figure out whether we could, we wanted to verify what they're using, right? So I said, can we step inside the house and they show us the product? And they're like, no, 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 you can't do that because if you step inside the house then that becomes a federal workplace, right? And so I was like, well, if I look through the, if they show me through the window, right, is that, okay, that going to be okay? So the bottom line is, and I think this has so far been working pretty well. It's not ideal, obviously. But the point is it gets at this notion that we need to understand the effects of products that people are actually using. And so the, the original uh, van and ideas funded by NIDA back in 2017, we run about 170 people through the, the protocol, and I'll show you some of the data. Um, we also have a grant from the state to look at concentrates, and then we have um, two other, uh, this is actually Cinnamon Bidwell, a close colleague, has a grant to look at pain and a grant to look at anxiety using similar <coughs> methods, but today we're just going to focus on the, the potential for risk and harm. <clears throat> okay, so this is the, uh, the, the plasma THC data, and what you're looking at here is basically, you know, immediate post-use, so they basically, they take their product, or they come down to the van, we do a blood draw, we do a bunch of assessments, they go back into their house, they use their product, they come immediately back to the van, we draw blood first thing so we can look at the, at the blood levels. And I think um, sometimes these uh, data points don't come out uh, on the screen, but um, what you're looking at here basically is four groups, one that used 16% THC flour, one that used 24% THC flour, one that was dabbing 70% concentrate, one that was dabbing 90% concentrate. And so you see the differences in blood levels here clearly different, right, between the concentrate users and the flower users. Now, you've seen a number of talks already, um, people presenting the blood data, so, you know, typically we do see levels around 100 nanograms per mil, um, and so obviously the concentrate people are significantly higher than that. What you can't see because the data points are showing up in this projection system is that we have data points all the way up here, right, which is why, why the y-axis is spread all the way up to 2,000. So the, the point is that people are coming to the van after using a concentrate and um, you know, we're seeing uh, blood levels of, plasma levels of 2,000, 2,300 nanograms per mil, right? So pretty, um, pretty high. And of course you've heard already too that you know, the, the blood level for, uh, sort of nominal level for intoxication for driving is like five nanograms per mil, right? And these people, by the way, they're not, they're not leaving on a stretcher, in case you're wondering, when they, when they leave the van. Now they walk out and they're, they're going to work or they're going to wherever they're going, right? So, so, you know, if you think about it for a second, we're seeing these super high blood concentrations, and, um, you know, so what do you expect in terms of the cognitive effects and the subjective effects? And, you know, Ryan kind of spoiled this earlier, I think, in, in, with some of his data, right? Because um, if you think about what you heard earlier, this might not be so surprising, you don't see big differences in terms of subjective intoxication or feeling high, right? So there are big differences in blood, but as Ryan mentioned, a lot of times people are basically titrating to a certain level, right? And in this case, you see that the even the flower people look a little higher than the concentrate people. They're basically titrating to a certain level of subjective intoxication. It just happens to be that for some of those people, that apparently is you know 2,000 nanograms per mil. So, <clears throat> so in terms of the cognitive effects, we have a battery uh, that we took from the NH toolbox, and then we also have uh, we add one uh, to that, which is recall, a verbal recall, which ends up being our most sensitive uh, cognitive task. And you see here that basically everybody's showing an increase in recall errors after using their product and that, that sort of maintained 60 minutes post-use. But again, no real differences across the groups, right? So the point being that uh, not only are people self-titrating, blood levels don't really match behavior uh, you know, or cognitive effects. And I think that's a, a point that was made earlier and certainly I think is, is borne out here. So um, I just gave you the, you know, the, the take-home points there. And, um, you know, so I think that maybe the, one of the, the big take on points is that individual differences are very important, right? So individual differences, we're seeing this huge variability in blood levels. And, you know, what, what's going on there? Is it tolerance? Is it, you know, something genetic that's different about these people? And I, I have no idea, you know, just thinking about it, it's hard to fathom how a person could walk around with that much, right? So maybe there's some saturation point where it doesn't matter anymore. But the point is there's something very interesting going on here. And the other point here from a sort of public health perspective is, well, if this, you know, these people who are super high in terms of their blood levels, anyway, if they, um, let's say they decide to quit using cannabis tomorrow, like how does that work, right? What does that mean? I mean, nobody really knows, right? And I think um, that's something that's gonna be, to, something that needs to be looked at. 
Okay, so we're going to move on now. We're going to talk about the combination of THC and CBD. And so how does or does CBD alter the use and effects of cannabis? And so here, what basically we're doing is a very similar approach, but we're comparing THC-only flour to THC plus CBD, like a one-to-one -one flour uh, versus a high CBD flour. So same kind of measures, same kind of approach that I described before. And so this is just looking at the plasma levels of THC. And you can see for the high THC group, you know, they're getting pretty up, pretty far up there like you saw before. The one-to-one -one group is sort of in the middle, and then the CBD group uh, is definitely lower, um, but still um, you know, a fair amount of, of uh, THC. And I should say, I didn't, uh, again, in the interest of saving time, I didn't uh, show the CBD graph. It's exactly the flip of that, right? So the same kind of thing, that the high CBD group is high, middle is middle, and the high THC group has no CBD. So what about feeling high? And this gets to this issue of whether CBD might mitigate some of the effects of THC. And what you see here is that basically the one-to-one uh, -one group is, you know, very consistent with the high THC group. They're both reporting similar levels of feeling high of intoxication. <clears throat> However, when we start looking at other measures, that, that doesn't hold up. It's actually kind of the opposite. They look more like, for example, the CBD group. So here we're looking at body sway. And you can see here, for whatever reason, we don't know yet, that one-to-one -one group is more like the CBD group in terms of body sway, not so much like the THC group. And when we look at things like how worried people are, how anxious they are, it's a similar kind of thing, that the one-to-one -one group looks more like the CBD group as opposed to the THC group. So this issue of whether, you know, how does CBD change the effects of, of THC, you know, maybe, um, uh, at least some of these data suggest, maybe it's specific to certain kinds of, um, uh, mood states, right, and or physiological states. So it may be different depending on the, the measure that you're looking at. Okay, so what about edibles, right? So this is, I mean, a very interesting thing. It's, it's you know, obviously been very difficult to study in the U.S. Patients use edibles um, bec sometimes because they last longer. Older people oftentimes or naive users will use edibles because they don't want to inhale something. And um, sometimes, too, people prefer it because the effect lasts a little bit longer. Oftentimes you see this in and patients who are using it for pain or, or, um, or other uh, purposes. So this is our uh, friendly bud tender on a, on a big sign over the interstate. I'm saying start low and go slow, which obviously um, we all know is, is pretty good advice. Um, so one of our very you know, simple questions here was how does, so basically the same kind of paradigm, right? They use the edible, we take their blood before, we take their blood after, we, add, we find out how much they use in terms of milligrams, and then we look at the, the the uh, THC levels uh, when they come back. So we want to know, does the amount of milligrams in the product correlate with the amount of THC in the blood? And there's some reasons why, obviously why it might not. You know, there's obviously individual differences in terms of metabolism, but also if there's a lot of error in the labeling of the product, that also would you know, basically interfere with um, this kind of association. But we do see a pretty high association uh, in terms of the uh, blood levels and the amount of milligrams they consume. And um, the, the reason for the two graphs here is that we, on the graph on the left, we eliminated the outlier, which you see on the graph on the right. So the graph on the right, one of the, one of the patients was using 180 milligrams, right? So, um, so, so we actually have about uh, double the sample size now. We're trying to sort of you know, let, the, let the range kind of fill in there between the outlier and, and the rest of the people. But, but it's interesting comparing the data to what uh, Ryan you know, presented earlier, because you know, here we're looking at people, you can see the, there's four people over 20 milligrams, and they're all between like 10 and 15 or 20 nanograms per mil, right? So it's, it's um, interesting to sort of see some of the differences there. Okay, so I thought it'd be also interesting to show you how, you know, what are the, for the edible people, how do they compare to the people I just showed you? So basically the first three bars here, and you've already seen, right? This is just showing you how the edible group fits into the flower people. And what you see here is that their THC blood level is actually you know, the lowest of the four, but kind of consistent with the CBD group. And we look at the subjective effects, though. Their subjective intoxication is, you know, is right up there, pretty close to the THC group, the flower group, and the one-to-one -one group. And um, so, again, it's going to be interesting to see how that sort of plays out. And, and obviously, Ryan presented a fair amount of data on this already, but it's kind of cool to see there's some, you know, correspondence between the more experimental approach and, and sort of the more a naturalistic approach that, that we've been using. So just to summarize um, the, the talk here, so short-term cognitive effects 
are definitely there. Um, uh, Harry mentioned this too, they're sort of minimal and sometimes hard to find. Um, not really any association between blood levels and effects. And you know, individual differences are probably really important here in terms of driving some of these effects. And um, so CBD seems to enhance some effects but may diminish other effects. And I think we're gonna, it's gonna be important to sort of figure out exactly how that works. And then uh, blood levels uh, seem to correlate pretty well with the label, labeled dose. And the subjective and cognitive effects are pretty similar to what we see with flour, even though the blood levels are different. So for medical users, um, you know, we're trying to basically do the same kind of paradigm, right? We're looking at, again, the same risks and side effects, but also looking at some of the positive effects in terms of um, pain relief, in terms of opioid use, in terms of anxiety. And, you know, the, the thing that's difficult to do, of course, in, in the U.S., is a full RCT because, you know, it's, it's almost impossible to do that with the products that are available that people are actually using. So we're trying to use similar kinds of designs to get at some of these effects, and, and hopefully we'll have some interesting data on that on down the road. So I think I'm going to stop there. Oh, no, sorry, one more slide. <laughs> so, so, um, so this just gives you a sense of the kind of things that we've been working on. But two things I wanted to call it really quickly, cannabis and diabetes. Somebody had a question about cannabis and diabetes. And we felt like this is, this is actually a colleague of mine, Dr. Brian, who's interested in doing this work. We thought this is really important, right? We have an opioid epidemic, but we've also had a longstanding obesity and type 2 diabetes epidemic. And understanding how these big changes might impact obesity and type 2 diabetes, we thought that had pretty you know, important public health significance. The grant got a first percentile, right? And NIDDK said, no, nope, no way, we're not touching that, right? We don't do cannabis research. So, so it's just, it kind of illustrates the, the, um, the difficulties that we face still, right? And, and understanding the public health significance of some of these issues. So we're still working on the other places that might, might pick it up, but um, I just, you know, a little disappointing. The last thing I want to say that I find the most fascinating area of research um, is aging, right? Because the, it's the aging population that's increasing the fastest in terms of, of use. And so the question is what, you know, these are people that might be vulnerable to the cognitive effects. I mean, how does that work out? But maybe there, there are all kinds of issues that, that might impact those effects, right? And we just don't have no idea about the risks and benefits for that aging population. And I'm sure a lot of you get questions from, from people who are older about you know, the risks and benefits. And, and so far, there's been very little research, right? So I, to me, that's one of the, the most important areas of research. All right, I just want to thank my, the funding agencies and my um, colleagues and collaborators. And I will stop and take questions. <laughs>